SJC 12723 in the matter of an impounded case. Good afternoon, Chief Justice Gantz, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. Um, I'm going to be focusing on my first argument today about <coughs> retroactivity. The juvenile in this case was adjudicated delinquent of disturbing a school assembly on October 16th, 2018, based upon conduct that occurred on February 16th, 2018. While the case was pending, the legislature passed the 2018 Criminal Justice Reform Act and included Section 159, which removed um, from being a violation of the Disturbing Assemblies Law, General Law Chapter 272, Section 40, the conduct of juveniles, juvenile students, secondary students within their school buildings. Uh, this conduct occurred within the school building. And the juvenile is asking this court to apply Section 159 retroactively to his pending case based upon the preamble to General Law Chapter 4, Section 6, and specifically with regard to the repugnancy exception. He asked the court to do that for two reasons. The first being that the legislature sought to, as part of its purpose in passing Section 159, to reduce the disproportionate impact on black, brown, LGBTQ, poor, and disabled youth. In Bradley, where that statute, where, where with that statute, the legislature sought to address a disproportionate impact on minorities and urban people, the court applied that statute retroactively. A second reason, um, the legislature also sought to reduce the contact between children and the juvenile justice system. And in Lazoel, this court said that where the legislature sought to do that, it would also apply that statute retroactively. That was another section of the Criminal Justice Reform Act. Did legislation um, provide anything, or did the legislature provide any, any provision for this sort of circumstance at all? It did not. It did not. And, and do you know, are there other criminal statutes that have gone down this road where the legislature has chosen to remain silent about something that might fall within the, the gap? I believe that the legislature has certainly passed criminal statutes where it hasn't spoken on whether or not to apply it retroactively or prospectively. Mm -hmm. Have I've, they ever, have they, the well, how about the opposite? Have they ever said it will? Yeah, in Commonwealth versus Dotson, that was a case where it was a criminal offense um, that the legislature decriminalized and the, this court did not apply that retroactively to a pending case. Um, but the, yeah. Isn't Laszlo just completely controlling here? Do I believe Laszlo can control in this case, yes. We don't really have to do a lot of analysis, do we? No, I, this case is on all fours with Bradley and Laszlo. Um, and if the court didn't have any further questions, I would rest on my brief for the remainder of the issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shulis, I guess the key question is why is this case not governed by Laszlo? Good morning, uh, Chief Justice Kans. Good morning, uh, Justices. Um, since Bradley, um, this court has recognized that in making its repugnancy determination that we can look um, to other statute, uh, other provisions of the act that were promulgated and enacted at the same time. Um, here, Section 159 was enacted with the entire sweep of the Justice Reform Act. Um, and similarly to Watts, um, where this court stated where there are compelling and significant reasons to consider other statutes within the entirety of the act, this court can do the same thing. So your question, why does Laszlo not, not, not control? In Laszlo, we didn't, um, the issue of first offense was not presented um, in that case. Neither of those juveniles were um, second offenders, if you will, or, or repeat offenders. And so this issue didn't really arise in Laszlo. Um, here it arises and it's significant and important because when we look at the entire juvenile justice system as a whole, there are very important and significant compelling goals that this court should consider. Rehabilitation of the juvenile and um, the, the legislators it stated and expressed purpose in holding repeat offenders responsible for the repeated act of minor misdemeanors or, or repeated acts of misconduct. 
But, but again, so Laszlo, again, it, it's a little fuzzy, but it, it involved the other two parts of uh, the new law. You know, uh, whether we drop this from 17 to 11, et cetera, et cetera. So wouldn't the same overall analysis apply here to the third part of that statute? We would need to distinguish the first offender provision from the dropping to 17 to 11 provision, whatever it is, I can't remember. Right. So uh, in, in Laszlo and in Wallace W. certainly guide us there. They tell us that uh, we are under the rehabilitative goals of the juvenile justice system. We are going to excuse a juvenile's first offense of a minor misdemeanor, but we, it is the second chance that t that's spoken about in Wallace. But when it comes to a repeat offense, we certainly need to address that, and I think the juvenile court is the right place to address it because it can address the specific juvenile's rehabilitative needs, which occurred here, incidentally. So here, um, this was not um, the juvenile's first offense, and so when he went before the juvenile court and had a trial where he was adjudicated delinquent on this offense of disturbing a school assembly, the juvenile court judge aptly um, gave him a disposition of probation, and once he satisfied the terms of his probation, the case was dismissed. So it, it considers the needs of the juvenile and the real rehabilitative needs of the juvenile. If we were to excuse this for, for uh, using terms in Wallace, second instance of a mi uh, commission of a minor misdemeanor, we would thwart the entire rehabilitative goals of the juvenile justice system altogether. And that cannot be what the legislature intended by enacting this statute. In fact, if we look at the purposes behind enacting this, this amendment, uh, section 159, and we look back to the session notes, it talks about the reasons behind it, and certainly um, reducing recidivism for those who enter, entering the juvenile justice system. That was one of the goals, because there, um, it talked about in-school conduct for which uh, uh, resource officers, school resource officers were, were, were intervening <coughs> and were um, calling in the police to um, resolve disruptive school behavior in school. Here we have a juvenile student who reached out to Channel 7 News to report an incident. So the police intervention here was not the result of in-school conduct that resulted in a principal or a resource officer calling in police. The, the intervention here or the disruption to the school was based on this juvenile's conduct in calling Channel 7 News to report that he felt like killing somebody because he didn't receive his school lunch. This is not the con type of conduct that the, the legislature sought to, um, that considered actually when it thought, sought to amend this statute. This was an in-school conduct for which police were brought in. This was in-school conduct reaching out of school to a news station that caused the police to intervene and disrupted the school. So in the confines and strictly construed under this juvenile's act in his circumstances where he has offended before, it would not be beyond this court's realm to, to consider the entire act and the entire goals of the juvenile justice system. Um, in Watts, this court did a similar thing. It considered multiple sections of the, the Reform Act um, in construing that it would not be repugnant to apply the statute prospectively. Um, there were compelling and significant reasons in Watts why this court decided to do that, and I suggest that there are compelling and significant reasons why this court should also apply this statute prospectively. And those reasons are the rehabilitation of the juvenile, as well as the legislated stated and specific goal to excuse only a juvenile's first offense of a minor misdemeanor. I think that we can look to Wallace and Laszlo as guides in interpreting the juvenile justice system. Um, those cases were decided post Chapter 69's enactment, and I think we need to look at the, all of the, statu all of the uh, different statutes, including Section 159, together to arrive at the just result here, and that is to consider all of the goals. We can consider the goal of reducing recidivism for the first time offender who enters the juvenile system, and we can also consider the rehabilitative goals of the juvenile when he repeats, when he repeatedly offends, and allow the juvenile court to retain its jurisdiction over the case, jurisdiction over this juvenile, where it can extend those re rehabilitative aids, really, to a, a juvenile who is in need of those re rehabilitative aids, as occurred here. But the fact remains that if this were to happen today, the person could not be a judge, a delinquent child for the, for the conduct. 
Correct. This case is very different where the, the case was pending. And so we look to the rules of statutory construction and we look to that presumpt presumptively prospective application. And this juvenile's case was pending in the enactment of the statute. Just like any other uh, conduct that's decriminalized, um, it takes effect upon the enactment unless expressly stated by the legislator that applies retroactively. But the, but the adjudication of the child as a delinquent child would have occurred after the statute had been enacted. Correct, and, and so we do look at the definition of delinquent trial, child, um, and in here, this juvenile falls outside the, that definition of those who can no longer be adjudicated delinquent because of his repeated acts of misconduct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.